Hello, I'm Esther Perel with The Learning Annex. I am the author of Mating in Captivity, Unlocking Erotic Intelligence, which you can read and you can listen in English and as well as you know that you have a whole international audience here listening to us uh, in multiple other languages that you will find on the website estherperel.com. Unlocking erotic intelligence is our topic today and I come to it as a couples therapist working in New York City as well as internationally looking at what we do today to bring a sense of aliveness and vitality and vibrancy and playfulness to our long-term relationships. How do we beat back a feeling of flatness, of deadness, of routine that often seems to creep in and that today is um, fundamentally against what we're looking for in a more fulfilled and happy and satisfying long-term relationship. So I will break it down with you and look at what are some of the erotic ingredients and why do we talk about erotic and why do we talk about intelligence? Can these two even meet and how is it that they suddenly fit in such a nice way? Um, I look at the subject of sexuality multiculturally. I try to look at it with nuance. I am standing here before you as an expert and yet not even the best poets have the truth on desire, on sexuality and on love. So I want to invite you in being experts together with me. You know a lot. You don't always tap into what you know. You're not always trusting that you already have these resources inside of you. and you rely on a certain advice that probably you would be able to give just as well to the people who come to you. Now, to look at erotic intelligence today is also asking us the question about the centrality of desire in sexuality. We have a model of sexuality today that is about pleasure, that is about desire, that is about satisfaction, that is about fulfillment. We broke down, certainly in the West, the exclusive aspects of sex for reproduction and for duty, sex as sinful, sex as dirty, sex as sacred only. And we have opened up a multiple space of sexual and erotic experiences that go beyond what we traditionally had experienced. And as such, I will speak to you if you are single, if you are married, if you are in a long-term committed relationship, if you are young, if you are old, if you are gay, if you are lesbian, if you are heterosexual. I want to broaden this so that each of you can get in touch with what is your own erotic self, what does it mean to cultivate, because that is going to be our central verb here, an erotic intelligence. And I want to add that the word erotic is much broader than a limited repertoire of sexual techniques. It puts us in touch with our aliveness, with the parts of us that we want to express in our pleasurable experiences. And erotic is primarily linked to imagination, to possibility, and to um, pleasure. It has no other function to it than a state of well-being and a state of transcendence sometimes, and particularly a state of presence. In the erotic experience, one is present, one is intentional, one is totally there, one is not thinking about five other things at the same time. And the elements of erotic intelligence have to do with our ability to be playful, and in order to be playful, of course, we need to be able to feel safe and to trust. No little child goes off in the world to play, to have fun, to be in touch with their exploratory and discovery needs if they don't feel that there's a secure base here that they will be there when they come back. So we can be adventuresome. We learn to be playful. We learn to be adventuresome, which really means we learn to experience freedom in the midst of a feeling of connection and security. So no playfulness goes together with anxiety or worry or threat, okay? But eroticism goes with playfulness. It goes with mystery. Mystery as in discovery, as in exploration, as in the unknown, the unexpected, the novel. Now I'm often asked, so how do you create mystery when you've been living together with somebody for umpteen years? So I want to ask you the question. If I ask you, when do you find yourself most drawn to your partner? Not sexually attracted, but drawn in the broader sense. What would you say? And typically, 
the answers I have received in the 20 countries where I have traveled in the last few years uh, pre presenting the book Mating in Captivity, the answers are remarkably homogeneous. That is what is really interesting, this, despite the multicultural. When I see my partner do something that they are passionate about, that's their own, when I see them play their music, when they are dressed up a certain way, when they are at a party and I see them talking with others, when I see how others look at them, when I am slightly jealous, when she makes me laugh, when he surprises me, when, um, when I feel in touch with my own uh, sexual intensity, but in each of these, when I look at my partner doing something that they're passionate about, that they are good at, when I see them on stage, when I see them at a gym, when I see them involved in something that is their own, you look at your partner not here, close by, where you no longer can distinguish the other person. You don't look at them that far off that you can no longer distinguish them. But you look at the other person or the other person looks at you at a comfortable distance where the edge and the comfort meet. So that I see this person who is usually already so familiar, so known to me, and I momentarily once again see them as somewhat mysterious, somewhat unknown, and mystery is sometimes no more than a shift in perception. Marcel Proust, the French author, talked that a true voyage of discovery isn't just about looking at new landscape, but looking with new eyes. What sustains desire, what creates an element of erotic intelligence is our ability to continuously go kaleidoscopic and to shift perspective and to shift perceptions on our partners as well as toward ourselves so that we don't become a fixed, knowable, predictable entity. Eroticism and predictability do not go well together. Novelty isn't about creating just new positions and new interactions in the bed itself. Novelty is new parts of us that we bring, new parts of the partner that we are with, that we are, that we are curious about. Curiosity is essential to the erotic experience. I would say that when you think about comfort, when you sit, you sit backwards. You are relaxed. You are in something that is reliable, that is predictable, that is known, that is cozy, that is dependable. And those are anchoring powerful experiences. But when you are in touch with the erotic, you are moving forward. You are leaning out toward the world, you're looking to see what will come at you, you are awake, you are intent, you are there to capture the, the surprises of life. That is part of the erotic intelligence in our sexual life, in reconciling love and desire. Another ingredient of the erotic and of how we cultivate that intelligence is anticipation. Our ability to imagine ahead of time. We are the only creatures who have an erotic intelligence. Animals have sex, but we have eroticism because we can imagine sex, even while we're not having sex. Meaning that I can imagine being with you, meeting you, embracing you, caressing you, kissing you, stroking you, being held by you, while you're not even here. And that sense of anticipation creates excitement, creates expectation, creates an elan, a movement. In that space between me and the other, and this other that I see as different from me, between self and other is this erotic elan. It is a movement. It isn't something that is static, that is flat, that is already known, that you've already gone around the block. And why do I say it's a cultivation of intelligence? Because we are born sensuous, but we become erotic. And we become erotic depends a little bit on the permission that we give ourselves to explore, to be playful, to discover. And that goes back to that little child. Tell me how you were loved, and I will tell you how you make love, is the essential question of the blueprint. If you have learned to love in a way that feels more filled with excess of responsibility and burden and worry and a need to flee for protection and a lack of trust and a sense of not being seen or recognized or held 
or respected. All of those fundamental experiences that give us a sense of self-worth and inner security, it becomes much harder to play, to take risks, to bring out hidden parts of ourselves, and our sexuality becomes more wrapped with shame and guilt and secrecy. So anticipation, playfulness. Playfulness is also um, teasing, flirting. And flirting isn't scoring. It isn't about doing something to get something. Flirting is our ability to play with possibility. Possibility in the erotic is the opposite of sex as a foregone conclusion. When you already know in the beginning what's about to, how it will be when it ends, then why bother? There is a beautiful phrase that says, in order to want sex, it needs to be sex that is worth wanting. So when you create that sense of flirtatiousness, one of the beautiful ways we do it today, more than ever for the last century, was writing. Writing has become the prime means of communication worldwide. Again, as it once was in history for that matter. We have replaced the phone again. We text each other. We write to each other. Now, if I say to you, shall we go for lunch? And I'm sitting in the same room with you. You may say, yes, that's a lovely idea. Why don't we go? But if I'm actually sitting next to you and I text you or I text you from the other room, you instantly are lifting yourself from the mundane into a world that becomes more playful and possible because you're going to start to answer me because it's unpredictable. And it is not what we are meant to do since we are sitting next to each other. So it is playful. It has mischief in it. And now I'm going to get an answer. Oh, yes, indeed. Isn't it a nice rendezvous? Where would you like to rendezvous? The language changes. The language becomes more suggestive. Suggestive is essential to erotic intelligence. It, no, it isn't always a direct, blunt, get to the point. No, it is suggestive because it awakens the desire, the wanting, the curiosity curiosity, the interest of the other. That notion of how you elicit desire, how you elicit an erotic presence in the other, it, that it's a two-way street. It is what I do to myself and it is what I evoke, what I bring out inside of you, and it is what you do that turns me on, that makes me pay attention to you. It is very clear that the erotic intelligence for women is often much more rooted between the ears than between the legs. Language, charm, the ability to feel chosen, to feel seduced, seduction, another essential ingredient of the erotic experience, is very much at the core of a female sexual desire is knowing that I am the one. And for that, you are seducing me. You are bringing me near you. You are teasing me. You are making this motion, this elan that we are talking about. And I become in touch with that side of me. I can leave motherhood behind. I can bring woman in. I can become in touch with the parts of myself that are about the permission to be here, to be in sexual experience and in the realm of desire with you. For men, the erotic is often more stimulated through the body, through the actual physicality of sex, through the visual aspect. So ask yourself another question. What are the senses that are most central to my erotic experience? Is it smell? Is it hearing? Is it seeing? Is it touching? Which one of the senses is central to my own erotic awakening and to my own erotic development? Ask yourself, where do you feel or when do you feel most erotic in your life? As in alive, playful, engaged, central other word, present, intentional, willful, all of that. Where do you feel most erotic? Then ask yourself, when do you feel most free in your relationships and in your life? Because freedom is core to desire. You can force sex. You can never force desire. You cannot force the wanting. Erotic experiences, erotic intelligence takes place in the realm of where we feel free, independent, free of worry, and all of that. So when do I feel most free in my relationship? What is the compliment that I enjoy receiving? When do I feel most attractive? When do I feel like breaking rules? The erotic is very much linked to the forbidden. 
you know, why is it that the forbidden and the transgressive are so intrinsic to the erotic experience? Because when you're doing something that you're not supposed to do, you know that you're doing something that you really want. You're not doing it to please anybody else. And when you're breaking the rules, you feel even more powerful and more free because it's yours and you own it. And desire is about owning the wanting. So ask yourself, what are the places of the forbidden? And to what extent do you like to transgress to cross it, to take yourself to places that you don't usually allow yourself to go versus the, the, the places where you hold in. You hold in for fear of rejection, you hold in from a feeling of insecurity, of fear of being hurt, of having been hurt, a fear of not being enough, a fear of not being able to meet the needs of the other. Look at what we call erotic blocks that have to do with your history, tell me how you were loved and I'll tell you how you make love, that have to do with your sense of inhibitions and prohibitions that roil inside of you against sexuality, against pleasure. Pleasure comes before sex. If you don't have a permission for pleasure, it's difficult to have good sexual experiences. And pleasure isn't just orgasm. Pleasure is also the ability to receive and to give and to feel worthy of receiving without worrying that you're taking too long or that your partner is bored, that you can be lavish, that you can be given to because you're worthy of it and somebody really likes you, wants you, desires you, loves you. Ask yourself also the question, um, what are some of the vulnerabilities that I grapple with that don't allow me to feel that sense of aliveness? How do I allow myself to go flat? What kills the erotic? What kills the erotic is often the fact that we become mired in the predictable and that we actually block ourselves to the unknown, to the surprises of life because they make us more anxious. Many people have a much easier time being erotic and playful outside of their family life or their couple relationship than on the inside. It's as if they, over time, trample the very erotic ingredients that brought the relationship into being. The novelty, the surprise, the unpredictable get flattened out because now I want you to be a certain way. I need to be able to rely on you. I'm going to be always the same as well. And together we will complain about erotic boredom, which is the next part of this equation. Erotic intelligence, erotic blocks, erotic boredom, erotic reawakening. What do I mean by erotic reawakening? Nobody lives in a permanent state of passion. But couples who have a spark are the couples who know how to resurrect, how to resuscitate. They know how to bring it back. And that means that they know how to go and enliven themselves, first of all. We get stimulated by life, by their own interests, by their separate pursuits, by what gives them pleasure, and then bring that energy back into the relationship. Desire needs space. If love wants closeness and no tension and no gap and no distance and no fight, desire needs space to thrive. Back to this presence, fire needs air. There needs to be a bridge to cross in which I come and get you and bring you toward me and bring you inside of me. Because at its ultimate, in the sexual experience, our erotic intelligence allows us to feel at the same time inside ourselves and inside another other. Inside ourselves, not just in our body, but in who we are, and inside our partner, not just into their body, but into their erotic space. Creating an erotic space is a space where I come together with you just to be, not to produce anything. Couples who have that spark are able to create a space, for example, by writing to each other, by breaking the rules together. They're not going to go to work once in a blue moon, first hour of the day. They're going to meet for lunch, actually, when they are well-dressed and awake, and not at the end of the day when they have nothing left to give. They're going to make sure that they are sexualizing and eroticizing each other throughout the relationship, like a sprinkle, so that they can then, when they meet, want each other because they are in touch with their own sexual self. That is how over time this energy gets maintained. Always me in touch with myself first to then be able to be responsive to you or to generate my interest toward you. 
And I would like to also let you know that I, my time is up for now, but remember, erotic and sex is not the same. It's an intelligence. You cultivate it, which means you learn it, which means it gets better with age because you develop it. You read about it, you watch it, you experience it in multiple parts of your life, and then you bring it into your sexual experiences. Desire needs space. Fire needs air. You need to be able to see another person, to want another person. Love and desire, they relate, but they also conflict. And herein lies the mystery of eroticism. My time is up. I thank you. I am Esther Perel, the author of Mating in Captivity, Unlocking Erotic Intelligence. My website, estherperel.com, and you can reach me and write to me and ask to be on my emails by contacting me through estherperel.com. Thank you.